Go A1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Gregory Stockel reports on Taiwan's participation in this week's APEC meeting. Gina Bennett has a story on the future of a two-state solution in Israel-Palestine. John Russell reports on new research into the hunting habits of cheetahs. I have a story on the increase of migrants to Spain's Canary Islands, and John returns for this week's Everyday Grammar lesson. But first... Taiwan is taking part in the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, meeting in San Francisco, California, this week. Because it is an economic gathering, the self-governing island democracy of 23 million people does not face diplomatic restrictions from mainland China. Taiwan's chief representative is a civilian rather than a government official. It is an unwritten rule by China that members of the organization join as economic representatives rather than state officials. For the seventh time, Morris Chong is representing Taiwan. He is the 92-year-old founder of Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Chong helped establish Taiwan's place as a top country for high-technology manufacturing in the electronics industry. Taiwan has participated in APEC since 1991 under the name Chinese Taipei. It began taking part just two years after the group began and the same year that China and Hong Kong joined. Taiwan has depended on retired ministers and industry leaders who are connected with the government but who do not have an office within it. The aim is to avoid angering China. China's economy has not recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. The country has high youth unemployment and large amounts of debt in a weakened housing sector. However, Chinese leader Xi Jinping is pushing ahead with his plan for China to retake its historical place as the center of cultural, political, and economic life in the Asia-Pacific area. Taiwan has a multi-party political system that centers around local issues. There is wide agreement on political separation from China. That presents a special challenge to the communist leaders of mainland China in Beijing. China wants to end U.S. arms sales to Taiwan, including military planes like the F-16 fighter jet. China also wants the U.S. to confirm it will not help the ruling pro-independence Democratic Progressive Party to keep power in Taiwan. John Kirby is a U.S. National Security Council spokesperson. He said Wednesday that President Joe Biden will make clear to President Xi that the U.S., while following the law, will continue to provide self-defense capabilities for Taiwan. China has sought to influence Taiwanese politics through military threats. It also seeks influence through economic opportunities 
on the mainland and local politicians. January's elections for the presidency and legislature will help decide whether the people want to continue independence or seek closer relations with mainland China. I'm Gregory Stockel. For 30 years, many nations around the world considered two states, one Israeli, one Palestinian, as the way to reach peace in the Middle East. VOA recently spoke to several experts about ideas for peace. Many people believe two states remain the only path forward even after Hamas's October 7th deadly attack and Israel's strong counteroffensive. Israel says Gaza's Hamas rulers killed about 1,200 people and kidnapped more than 240 in their attack. Gaza's health ministry, which is led by Hamas, says more than 10,000 people have died in Israel's counteroffensive. However, political expert Uriel Abulov of Tel Aviv University believes the loss of life on both sides has not made peace possible. Abulov said the war has created a chance for people to understand that this is not a conflict between the majority of Israelis and Palestinians, both of whom want to live in coexistence without radical leaders, he said. On one side, you have Hamas, which you have to deal with militarily. And on the other side are Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his coalition, which need to be dealt with politically, he told VOA. Hussein Ivish is with the Arab Gulf States Institute that is based in Washington, D.C., He also believes that a permanent solution to the long conflict is possible only with a two-state model. He said it could be done in steps. Israel must finally and formally accept the Palestinian right to a state and the need for it. The construction and establishment of settlements must stop completely, he said. Ivish believes Israeli settlements in the West Bank, one of the two Palestinian territories, should be halted. Israel completely withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005. Ivish also said Palestinians must condemn the Hamas attacks of October 7th and promise to end the violence. He said the Palestinian Authority, which governs the West Bank, must be strengthened. Other experts are doubtful. Omer Bartov is a professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University in the American state of Rhode Island. Bartov believes the two-state plan is unrealistic. He said it would create an economically weak Palestine that is dependent on Israel. 
He added that because there are between half a million and 750,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank, their removal from the territory would mean civil war. He also notes there are 2 million Palestinians who live in Israel. Israel captured the West Bank, along with East Jerusalem, from Jordan in the Six-Day War of 1967. It took Gaza from Egypt in the same war, but withdrew from the territory. Bartov said another possibility is a confederation of Palestinian-Israeli states within the 1967 borders. A confederated state, he said, would permit Palestinian refugees to return to territories their ancestors left when Israel was created. Jerusalem could be the common capital he said. There would be a difference between citizenship and residence, said Bartov. Jewish settlers could continue to live in the Palestinian state, but behave according to its regulations. And the Palestinians could return from exile. However, he said the single state solution seems impossible because of the current war. Ivish of the Arab Gulf States Institute said U.S. involvement would be important to any permanent solution. He said the U.S. is the only country with the influence to guarantee a two-state peace agreement. However, he said there is a large political cost in the U.S. to put too much pressure on Israel. Bartov of Brown University agreed that no plan is possible without the U.S. support on which Israel depends politically and militarily. Without it, he suggested, the endless warfare would only continue. I'm Gina Bennett. Cheetahs usually hunt during the day, but the fast cats change their activity to early morning and early evening hours during warmer weather, a recent study says. The time change sets the creatures up for more possible conflicts with competing predators, such as lions and leopards, that often hunt at night, say the study writers. Their research was published recently in Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Brianna Abrams of the University of Washington was a study co-writer. Abrams said that changing temperatures can have an effect on the behavior of large carnivore species and also the dynamics among species. While cheetahs only eat fresh meat, Lions and leopards will sometimes take food from smaller predators. Lions and leopards normally kill prey themselves, but if they come across a cheetah's kill, they will try to take it, said Bettina Wachter of the Cheetah Research Project at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. The cheetahs will not fight the larger cats. They will just leave said Wachter, who was not involved in the study. Hunting at different times of the day is one way to reduce meetings between the different predator species that share northern Botswana's mixed grass and forest lands. But the new study found that on the hottest days, when daily temperatures got to nearly 45 degrees Celsius, 
cheetahs became more active at night. This means cheetahs spent 16% more time hunting when other big cats hunt. Qasim Rafiq of the University of Washington and the non-profit Botswana Predator Conservation Trust was another co-writer of the study. Rafiq said about the shared hunting hours, There's a greater chance for more unfriendly encounters and less food for the cheetahs. For the current study, researchers placed GPS devices on 53 large carnivores, including cheetahs, lions, leopards, and African wild dogs. Researchers then recorded their positions and hours of activity over eight years. They compared this data with the highest daily temperature records. While seasonal differences explain most temperature changes in the time between 2011 to 2018, the scientists say the observed behavior changes offer information about the future of a warming world. In future research, the scientists plan to use audio recording devices and accelerometers, like a Fitbit for big cats, said Rafiq. The goal is to document the number of meetings between large meat-eating animals. In addition to competition with lions and leopards, cheetahs already face strong pressure from the loss of living space and conflict with humans. The fastest land animal, cheetahs are the rarest big cat in Africa, with fewer than 7,000 left in the wild. These climate changes could become really critical if we look into the future. It's predicted to become much warmer in this part of Africa where cheetahs live, in Botswana, Namibia, and Zambia, said Vokter of the Cheetah Research Project. Fifteen-year-old Ghanaian Musa Kamara is one of a record 32,000 migrants who have arrived in Spain's Canary Islands this year. They travel an extremely dangerous path by sea from Africa. Musa's parents are dead. He left Guinea last month. The teenager crowded into a wooden boat with 240 other migrants for the trip to the Canary Islands. The trip took 11 days. They did not have enough food or fresh water. Twenty people died during the trip, the travelers said. The path they took is considered one of the most dangerous for migrants. Kamara arrived October 27th, tired and hungry. He soon faced another problem. Police registered him as an adult. That meant he was not permitted into a center for minors with better opportunities available. Kamara was with a friend also registered as an adult at an old military base in Tenerife's mountains. There, about 2,000 migrants await transfers to mainland Spain or permission to go elsewhere in Europe. Registering him as an adult means that instead of receiving extra support to find housing and education until age 18, he will have to support himself alone. A bone test would be required to prove his age but Red Cross papers support Kamara's claim that he is 15 and not 18, as the police said. Canary Islands President Fernando Clavijo told Reuters that the registration issues 
show that the government is overwhelmed by the numbers of arrivals. We have neither the resources nor the calm to deal with the avalanche coming in, he added. He blamed police for processing errors as about 100 children a day came into the Canaries. He said Spain's national government was not dealing with the issue. He said it has only offered to move 347 migrant children to other areas until December. Additionally, human rights organization Amnesty International said in a recent report that 12 out of 29 migrants it interviewed at adult centers in the Canaries were actually minors. For children wrongly identified as adults, it is their responsibility to find an aid group to help them. Such supporters can request a bone test for a child to confirm their age. However, that process can take months. Amnesty officials said the policy is unfair. The group said such tests should only be used if there was substantial doubt about a migrant's stated age and no other proof. There are eight Canary Islands. El Hierro is one of those most affected by migration. The island has a population of 9,000. More than 11,000 migrants have landed there this year. In one weekend this month, 500 people arrived in El Hierro on four boats. Out of those 500, four people died and about 15 others were admitted to the island's 31-bed hospital. Clavijo said the European Union should do more to fix the causes of migration from Africa. Current policy was to mistreat them at borders out of sight of most Europeans, he said. Do you know what a mother or father has to go through to put their six-year-old or seven-year-old son in a small wooden boat with 200 or more people they don't know and throw them into the open sea at night, he asked. These people don't do it for fun. Americans will soon celebrate Thanksgiving. The holiday involves family, friends, and food. A common expression Americans say to each other at this time of year is Happy Thanksgiving. In the spirit of Thanksgiving, we will pay careful attention to the first word in the expression, Happy you will learn about the history and usage of this common five-letter adjective and its related noun form. Let's start. We can bring words to life by learning about their histories. In this way, words become like close friends. We know their backgrounds, their beginnings, and how they have changed over time. Happy is and always has been, a positive word. The online etymology dictionary says the word dates to the 1300s. At the time, it meant lucky, favored by fortune, prosperous, as well as very glad. Soon after, it came to mean greatly pleased and content. The dictionary also tells us that the majority of the words for happy in European languages, first meant lucky. From the word happy, we also have a noun form, happiness. When we compare the adjective happy with the noun happiness, we find that English speakers use happy much more often. 
That information comes from Google's Ngram Viewer, an online database that examines thousands of books. We have learned a little about the history of the adjective happy. So, how do English speakers use it in modern times? Perhaps the most common usage is after linking verbs. These are verbs that link their subjects with their predicates. Adjectives are commonly used after linking verbs to describe the subject. Google's Ngram Viewer says some of the most common structures involve the verb be. For example, you are very likely to hear or read, I am happy, or he was happy. We also use happy with other kinds of linking verbs, feel, seem, and others. Happy is also used with intensifiers, words that make an adjective stronger. Two of the most common, Google's Ngram viewer tells us, are so and very. These intensifiers are then used along with linking verbs. Consider these examples. You look so happy. We are very happy. They seem so happy. In all of these examples, the structure is linking verb plus intensifier plus happy. A few final words on the modern usage of happy. You are also likely to hear the adjective happy used to express kind wishes around some holidays. Thanksgiving, for one. In America, you will often hear statements such as this. Happy Thanksgiving. These statements are a kind of sentence fragment, or an incomplete sentence. There is no subject. The subject and main verb are understood between the speakers. A complete sentence would be, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving, or I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. We shorten these sentences because the first part is understood. That is how we arrive at Happy Thanksgiving. In today's report, we explored one word, happy. You learned about its history and common usages with linking verbs and intensifiers, as well as holiday wishes. You may or may not celebrate Thanksgiving where you live, but we can end this lesson by wishing you a very happy day. I'm John Russell. Timer. John Russell joins us now to talk a little bit more about the lesson. Welcome back, John. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me on the show. Your lesson today explored the word happy. We learned about common ways the word is used after linking verbs or to express wishes for a holiday. Was there something you did not include in the lesson that you would like to talk about more here? Yes, there were several items that did not make it into the lesson. One of them is this. We use the adjective happy to express kind wishes on many other holidays, the 4th of July, Easter, as well as on birthdays. But there is one big holiday that we almost never use happy with. That's Christmas, right? Yes, that's correct. You almost always hear Merry Christmas. We use Merry instead of happy. A second question. We have talked in general about wishing others a happy Thanksgiving, but I'm curious to know some specifics about your Thanksgiving plans. What do you plan to do on Thanksgiving this year, John? I'm not traveling. I'm taking my family over to my friend's house. We are having something you might call a Friendsgiving, celebrating Thanksgiving with friends. What about you, Dan? What are your Thanksgiving plans? I'm going to Philadelphia for Thanksgiving, as I've been doing for the past several years. I have some family I'm excited to see. That sounds like great fun. Thanks for coming on the show today, John. Thank you for having me. See you next time. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.